Pan Pan Psychast. Part three, further analysis and discussion. So in this section, we're going to break down our further analysis thoughts into two broad themes. The first, we're going to discuss the overall metaphysics of Epicurus, our thoughts on that. And the second part of this third part, yeah, there's not much order here. It's all chaos and atoms and swerve. We're going to be looking at ethics and what we might want to take forward from Epicurean philosophy. So let's jump in with the metaphysics first of all. My first thoughts after reading it, and one of my favourite parts was talking about atomism, I'm sure it was yours as well, <laughs> is that what we get from Epicurus is this complete interdependent system. We get a goal of human life, a theory of knowledge, a description of reality, the evolution of the world, life, and everything we find in it. That was way more than I was expecting when I read a couple of the introductions. You should be happy and avoid pain and suffering. I was like, no, I've got like, I've got a whole theory of the entire mm. world to it. Mm. But unfortunately, or well, unfortunately depends, I'd be quite enchanting, wouldn't it, if there were all these infinite worlds with gods just dangling around, being tranquil. But unfortunately, this isn't what modern physics teaches us. First of all, atoms can be broken down to protons, neutrons, and electrons. And then even those can be broken down to further subatomic particles, which exhibit wave characteristics or are made up of quarks as well. Unfortunately, he's wrong when he says that the atom is something that's indivisible from the get-go. Modern physics as well would teach us that an electron is considered by lots of quantum theorists to be an excitation of like a quantum field of the electron field rather than being made up of particles. So you might think that fundamentally the world is made up of strings rather than particles. So when Epicurus says that fundamentally the world is made up of physical particles, mm. that's an outdated view of, of physics. So the spirit's there though, isn't it? Yeah, I, I don't see this to be... A, we mentioned this when we were talking about atomism in the actual episode, that he was hypothesizing without the ability to be able to examine atoms so he can't arrive at the conclusions without just massive speculation mm. and that's not his fault the bits that matter that still hold whether it is the process that you've just explained and we're talking more about waves and and fields of energy and not just indivisible atoms at the bottom of everything still it still applies to the sense that things mm break apart and and will not last forever mm. and that, that we have no real reason to believe that we should ha see souls that are separate to the physical that interact with the physical things and all of that stuff so his conclusions based off atomism still hold quite true today mm. minus the bits that you've already said there about that we have no reason to posit that there are weird god-like creatures out there but can't get everything Sort of his general concepts are still relevant to science today and is sort of the details of his theories which aren't as much so for example we wouldn't think that lightning is clouds rubbing against each other and that sort of thing but then the idea of having hypotheses is very relevant to science and it's the same with other ideas of his that things come about by chance there isn't a top-down mind who's influencing our world the, that fits our materialist worldview and also of giving naturalist explanations rather than theological ones and other assumptions like nothing arises from nothing and nothing passes into nothingness are still um, very relevant in our idea of modern science. I would concur with Rose. I think, yes, does Epicurus get the science wrong as far as we know it today? Yes. But I think it's also a bit of a straw man to look back at. I think as, as old as Epicurus, right, like 2,000 years ago, and be like, oh, you didn't quite get the science right there, buddy. I think you can also have a bit of respect for, you know, he was doing the best he could at the time he had. The idea of maybe not accepting supernatural claims for, for things happening in the world, I think, are principles that still carry on and that people mm. would say are, are, worth, are worth looking at and worthy of further analysis. It's it's not just criticism, I think, as a point of like, yeah, you know what, that, those are principles that we can agree today are good. Well, at least in philosophical schools, and, and I suspect that a lot of scientists would probably say the same thing as well, is that there seems to be an argument being made, well, not seems, I think there definitely is an argument being made from the Epicureans that to look at the world rationally is better for you to do mm -hmm. and that if you if you attempt to understand the world scientifically 
now not good not back then but once you understand how the world works or at least in some basic level i'm not sure everybody uh, has the capacity to understand all of the complexities of physics to expert level hmm. but besides the point you don't need that but knowing that alleviates certain problems and or like, might settle certain questions that you don't need to worry about hmm. i certainly agree with that principle um, otherwise, like philosophy seems to have <laughs> very little <laughs> practical use if it's all just contemplation and and no way that should make you help help you navigate the world. Mm. I, I was really interested in what I thought was quite a novel and ingenuitive way of solving the problem of fine tuning because that's one which you start off with when you think that there's just atoms and they're just physical bits, and by saying there's no design, no conscious intelligence, that it is just atoms in motion and swerving and i'm sure we'll talk about swerving a bit more in a moment is that you can only get this universe then if you've got infinite possible worlds or an infinite world so i like the fact that he says well this universe is infinite and then you'd have all kinds of combinations of these atoms every possible combination so you might think that gives you an explanation for how it is that complex organisms intelligent life can exist i'm sure does anyone think that the universe is infinitely large anymore D doubt anybody thinks not in not in the same way i i think when we were doing stuff on cosmology that if the universe might very well still be you know it's, it's expanding mm. but that doesn't mean that it's infinite yeah there are mm. two different things mm. i think a lot of uh, professional philosophers are highly skeptical of actual infinities at all aren't they they think that leads to absurd consequences we could go into those arguments but we'll save them for another day should we talk about the swerve so in the last installment ollie you suggested that swerving was a part of surf culture is it <laughs> yeah it's uh, apparently quite a famous fashion brand connected to billabong is it? jack so yeah so yeah, i think you can get like a swerve what's oh, a fashion brand yeah I swerve so. something to do with surfing i don't think it's like a surf move no i mean i'm not a surfer i don't know what they're called i mean i know the words board and surf so that's the extent of my knowledge if any surfers out there that want to get in contact with us and let us know if swerving is a thing um, all i know is i think it's a fashion brand connected to surfing that was the joke sorry if that was uh, didn't didn't sound legit no it wasn't legit though was it <laughs> it didn't sound legit you've just said it's not something to do with surfing swerving i don't think it's a surf move i don't think so no. i apologize to the listeners we're just gonna leave that <laughs> i don't think i've got anything to apologize for okay. to be honest. Right. let's swerve no, over to, to rose with her analysis of swerving <laughs> Um, so we mentioned earlier that the notion of a swerve is quite problematic in itself because it's a logical contradiction within their theory that if the swerve it can either be caused or uncaused, and they're saying basically that it's uncaused, but they're also saying one of their guiding principles is that nothing can come from nothing, so it's a problem because how did the swerve come if it can't come from nothing? And the other problem with it is that we mentioned as well about the problem of free will and so their explanation for free will is that it was caused uh, by the swerve at the atomic level but that's not the normal notion that we have of free will of us making a decision in the words of george strodak this is not ordinarily what we mean by moral freedom and of both counts the doctrine of the swerve is a complete failure and a blot on ancient materialism it is scientific nonsense and ethical folly and is destructive to the very values of epicureanism sought to protect which i sort of agree with but could you not have like atoms motion of atoms which is constant and swerve and just say those are the three fundamental things in the universe I have objects which are atoms, I have two laws of motion, and that's all there is on the bottom layer. And that's what Epicurus is saying, right? Is he adding, it doesn't seem like he's adding like a great deal by going, and they sort of wiggle around a little bit. <laughs> like that's not, it's not a massive thing in a metaphysics pie, is it? It's uncaused, yeah, but so are the atoms. They're uncaused as well. They're the, you've got to have some kind of fundamental thing. I think he would say that the atoms are caused because they're eternal. So they've always been on this constant loop. So no one has, they haven't been caused. They're just always there. Yeah, but I don't see why I can't just say the same about swerve and motion too. But yeah. it's by the by. I wouldn't dare to criticize him because he's got a lot of sass and I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of it. <laughs> <laughs> another slight contradiction uh some people would say in his theories about arguing that pleasure is the highest good so all our actions are judged as morally good or morally bad depending on their outcome so mm. whether they bring pleasure or whether they bring pain and a criticism to this which we can already draw back to plato who argued that reason is the highest good 
because when you're doing the hedonic calculus of deciding whether an action is good or bad you are using reason to work out whether it would bring pleasure or pain so you're looking outside of pleasure to reason making it a higher a higher good this is a very long discussion in the history of ethics as to what constitutes good simple ones worth bringing up at least in terms of ethical decisions in where we're thinking about how we are treating one another and not necessarily just worried about our own individualistic mm. well-being is that some people like to make the distinction between i think we mentioned this on the podcast before of the distinction between pain and harm mm. and mm. and what that might mean so some people say you could be wronged and you could be harmed in some way and that those mm. two things can be different so you could imagine how somebody i think an often used example is let's say if somebody was stalking you you didn't know about it mm. and you're not physically suffering in any mm. way and yet you are in some sense being wronged um and you could look at that in modern contexts with like let's say somebody uploads a video of some uh, or or a image of somebody else online they don't know about it and yet other people are viewing that content in some way they have been wronged mm. and somebody might want to say ethically speaking is that just because the person doesn't know about it doesn't mean it's good because it increases the pleasure of other people mm. looking at these pictures or these videos in some cases we might want to say it's not just it doesn't just come down to the pleasure mm. and pain otherwise it seems to be there is nothing wrong on that account as long as that person never finds out well there's two issues here then isn't there? there's one that his naturalistic explanation of where moral values comes from must be missing something it can't all come down to pleasure and pain but two, does this mean that we should fear death? Because the whole point of that was we shouldn't fear it because during death we cannot feel pain or pleasure. But if we can be harmed and not feel pain or pleasure, and that's still wrong, then we could still be harmed by death. Yeah, and I think we were getting into that territory where we were saying that, and I think Rosie might have mentioned this, where the things that worry some of us about death is not necessarily the we're going to be dead per se it's all of the missed opportunities for things so mm. i build up a bunch of relationships with people there was something that i wanted to be able to do for mm. this other person and i'm no longer going to be able to do that or i was involved with a long-term project that i really wanted to see through to the end and i won't get to 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 finish that off or i made a promise mm. and i can't fulfill that and so in that in that sense then death is concerning for a lot of people not just because it's the end of everything but that finitude in a different way of thinking mm. about it that doesn't you don't get to solve the problem by simply saying you won't feel that way mm. you see and that seems to be a problem so his idea of morality is grounded in that social contract between friends, the agreement to help one another when you're being harmed, to violate that contract would be seen as like the social wrong. This idea that we exclude all non-human animals, first of all, we spoke about this at length on the show before, so we don't need to do it again. But there does seem something objectively morally wrong when I go out and kick a dog in a forest. It seems like I've created gratuitous suffering onto another agent. And the majority of professional philosophers surveyed in the Phil survey a few years ago thought that they were moral realists, they believe in objective moral truths, and Epicurus obviously goes the, the other way in a sense. Like, he thinks there is an objective moral truth in that you independently should pursue happiness and avoid pain, and that communally you can reach those goals individually but together but that does exclude caring about people's pain and suffering mm. who are outside of that community, mm. which would include non-human animals. I think for a lot of us, that would strike us as wrong. This was my biggest reflection on on the reading with this. So uh, last year, I read Paul Bloom's The Sweet Spots, which is a whole book about moral psychology, mm -hmm. people's pursuits of, of different things. Now, his position is one of what he calls motivational pluralism. So it's too simplistic just to say simple hedonism or even like a refined hedonism which is perhaps what we could say epicurus was kind of getting at i'm not sure how much of this is big consequences for epicurean thought because they might just be able to adopt a lot of this stuff and just say okay epicurus got this wrong but it still kind of fits in with the model there seems to be certain things that people do that can't just be easily explained by saying it was good because it made people really happy mm. so there's there's a bunch of different psychological studies that have just involving questioning people about their lives 
lives and fulfillment and stuff like that. Well, one of the things here, so this is a survey of over 2 million people's responses to how meaningful they felt their lives were. So just to be clear here, some people might say it's meaning in my life that matters more than just simple hedonism. Mm. It says, it turns out the most meaningful job is being a member of the clergy. This is followed by serving in the military, being a social worker and working in a library. This is an intriguing list. All of these jobs involve a lot of personal engagements and some amount of difficulty. The pay isn't great and they are not very high status. So there could be lots of things that people are prepared to do that they find on, on reflection of a whole lifetime that they say that was worthwhile, mm -hmm. even if in the moment they weren't necessarily super happy or like tranquil or or fulfilled in that sense but it's, it seems to be worthwhile other big examples that bloom points to is with uh, child rearing as well that you could see in epicurean thought that actually to have a child in a long-term relationship with somebody else could actually promote lots of anxieties and worries you have got to worry about keeping your child safe mm. and how they're going to how they're going to grow up and all of the things that all parents might well, not all, but a lot of parents worry about for their children. And Bloom cites a study to do with this, in which he emphasizes the point of attachment being the important thing. So he says, the attachment one has to an individual can override all decrease in the quality of a person's life. Mm. And so the love we usually have towards our children means that our choices have value above and beyond whatever effect that has on our happiness. So you could imagine how somebody could really struggle to provide a better life for their child. They might worry a lot at the time. And after all is said and done, it was still worthwhile. Mm. And that has nothing to do with ataraxia mm. and has everything to do with the drama of human life and, and striving for a better life and the meaning that comes with the deep bonds that we have, even when it's difficult. I don't know if that's, like I said, I'm not sure if there's a massive knockdown criticism, but it seems to say that there is certainly more to, to life than ataraxia being the, the worthwhile pursuit of happiness. I feel like it really overlooks that some things that have the possibility of the greatest pleasure also have the possibility of real pain. And if you were a true Epicurean, you would always go for that avoiding, but that would really make you miss out of a lot that brings meaning to our life. So, Rose and Andy, if ataraxia is not your bag, then maybe eudaimonia might be the kind of thing that we're looking for here. So, obviously, not a contemporary of Epicurus in the sense of there were adults at the same time, but obviously Aristotle, his whole idea of like virtue ethics and virtue theory is based on the idea of achieving human flourishing, right? So... In Aristotelianism, it's not just about pleasure, it's about cultivating certain qualities like virtues, things like patience, things like courage and generosity, and that by cultivating these virtues, we will be able to flourish uh, in the world. And it's not as simple as Epicurus with, okay, if it's a pleasurable experience, do it. If it's not, avoid it. Aristotle says to be a good politician, you might have to suffer. You might have to suffer quite a bit, actually, that developing that character, developing those virtues is something that could involve quite a significant amount of pain. I mean, if you ever talk to anybody who goes to law school, I mean, law school sounds pretty <laughs> much mostly suffering, not a lot of pleasure. But the long term goal of doing a job like a lawyer or becoming more virtuous, such as you know, courageous, patient, etc., will allow you to flourish even like being a parent, right? That experience of having a child, yes, it may have anxiety, both mental and physical. Having a newborn baby, if you know anyone with a new baby, is they don't get a lot of sleep. Um, that's not a very pleasurable experience, but it's worth it in the end for the the sense of eudaimonic feeling that they get from, from raising this child and flourishing and helping that person reach their potential as well. So I think this is a pretty valid criticism. It's not a new one. It certainly would have been around in Epicurus' mm. time. I think a lot of Aristotelians, for example, would have said, is pleasure the ultimate goal? Well, no, it's it's eudaimonia, and that would involve some mental anguish. You know, mm. it doesn't to, to to flourish, to grow, does involve some form of suffering at times, and that's okay. Well, there are some interesting responses that Epicurus could offer. So, first of all, yes, it's personal pleasure that's important, personal happiness. Mm tranquility better put but also he gets out of a few sticky situations by relying on the community mm. that perhaps you've got a friend who contributes nothing to the relationship for example it would be wrong says epicurus to throw that person aside and start focusing on yourself and other people who do give you time because other people in the community will see you throw that person aside and they won't trust you as well 
Similarly, he gives the example, I think, of someone who's suffering from a disability. They can't, in this thought experiment which he conjures up, they can't help you in any way. They can't protect you from wild boars or from attackers. And the, the, perhaps the mutant, they can't offer you like the, the tools of exploring the metaphysics of nature. They can't offer you anything in the utility of friendship. Yeah, he says it would be wrong again to throw that person aside and not have a friendship with them because others will see, oh, that's the kind of person they are. And it will break down trust in the community. Now, the problem with this, I think, and you probably came across loads of students who say this, is that when you claim that everything comes down to pleasure and feeling good and avoiding pain, it's, it's really hard to push someone for an example of what would constitute an example of someone doing it for something other than pleasure. Someone goes, oh, it's always for your own pleasure or pleasure of somebody else. You want to shake them and go like, what about people who sacrifice their lives for other people, running into the Twin Towers or sacrificing themselves during the Holocaust? Or take Trodex example again, he says, what about the parents who scrimp and sacrifice for eight years to put their two sons through college, which struck me as quite a personal example, which he hasn't quite let go. But the idea being that there are things that people do for other reasons than just happiness and pleasure. I think your analysis of meaning there was really good, but yeah. art and philosophy and science, like they don't for the sake of themselves yeah i think and if we can't say for the sake of themselves i just think the conception of happiness and hedonism is too crude on the on the level that epicurus gives us so even if we said so just to be clear bloom talks about struggle mm -hmm. meaning sacrifice i mean struggle and sac sacrifice could be part of the same category one could assume these things are all seem to be things that pe human beings go out of their way to do. Mm. So you, you will have people who will want to, and it mentions mountain climbing as a good example of this, where some mountain climbers don't have really any pleasurable sensations in the entire experience of doing it. It's a massive struggle. Even points out that when they're doing it with other people, mm -hmm. that that isn't good because they get frustrated with one another. Mm. And that like, so there isn't any like camaraderie. I, there. Uh, I agree. Like, just the thought of it, Andy, is just, bringing me suffering right now. <laughs> so it's like this brutal, not every climb, of course, but there are certain climbs that are yeah. so hard and people have to train for months on end just to be able to do them. It's this pursuit that seems to go against the grain of what would constitute a good peaceful easy life mm. and yet people do it they want to do it if if only just to say that they've done it now you could then the headness might be able to respond and say so actually when you deep down people are doing this because they want the social reward at the yeah. end that comes with the pleasure of that but I'm just not quite sure if that explains everything. I mm. still think that there might be some people who would go out of their way to really struggle, even if they didn't get much social reward for mm -hmm. it. Whatever we explain that in, it's just not as simple as basic hedonism. I don't think that's quite the, the right way to put it. Yeah, I could push back on you slightly. I don't think necessarily people do it just for maybe the social acceptance or if I'm misphrasing you there. So there's lots of activities that people do which objectively are painful, right? That people seek out because they are painful. Chili eating competition, eating chilies over and over again, certain forms of piercings and tattoos, uh, people that run those, oh, what they called, are they called like super marathons? Have you ever heard of these? Where yeah. someone yeah. runs literally nonstop until there's only one person left, pretty much. So they're not like a marathon where you have a certain distance, it's just you've got to go, keep going, and they can go on for days and days and days. Um, lots of people seek out this pain, because ultimately at the end, they're even seeking some kind of rush at the end, which is pleasure, the satisfaction of completing a difficult task, like climbing a mountain or the satisfaction of beating other people in a competition i think you could still maybe link it back to pleasure in that sense right so when people do things that cause them pain sometimes it's to get mm. the pleasure yeah. after the pain right? so that's kind of what i was alluding to i just yeah. used one example so yeah. it could be the social pleasure that comes with prestige like i climbed this massive mountain what a great achievement that i i made and mm. when you can tell that story again and again and again about how you reach the peak and mm. each time somebody will admire your efforts and in that sense, you could say, well, that big struggle was always actually, when it comes down to it, down to quite primitive, basic human emotion about mm. uh, hedonism. My point was just that I think it's just slightly more complicated. I think that you can hold two motivations at once. So mm, yeah. you might do yeah. something because you want to brag about it in some way, but you also might do it for some deeper meaning. Those two things don't have to be like mutually exclusive, one ruling out the other, because otherwise then literally all human explanations could be put down to really simple, basic things of, I did it because I wanted pleasure. And I, I repeating myself, I just think it's slightly more complicated than that. Yeah. Let us pause for we Jiffy to say a quick thank you to the show's tranquil patrons for making the episode possible. 
In particular, a very special thank you to the man who didn't quite get Epicurean's point. Is Joe Richardson? There's no need to fear death for Carter Young. He had all of the purple and gold robes he can ever want. It's Dan Posh. Quivering from fear of the gods, it's Zarchery Arnold. On a highway to happiness, it's Matt Carrera. The atoms of his soul can't stop swerving. It's Neural Surge. <laughs> That's really good. He likes his atoms woolly. It's Anthony Welsh. <laughs> she can't live on bread alone. It's ill, Elijah Hughes. And last but certainly not least, the man who is so tranquil that his atomic films beam across the cosmos. The man so hydrated that he will never die of kidney stones. Yep, you guessed it. It's our eternally perfect patron whose atoms will never disperse. It's Mr. Jim Clare. If you're enjoying the show and you want to treat us to a slice of cheese, then please head over to the patreon.com forward slash panthicast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into it. You did so oh, well. Yeah, well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought I was going to do it really quickly. Like, yeah, it's funny. It's funny. Just, oh, atomic themes. <laughs> I feel like it's frustration with the philosophy is that they can really twist every example of motivation and show that ultimately it is for pleasure, even though it feels wrong because we feel within ourselves that there are other motives but on mm. the other side it's maybe not a bad thing because it sort of shows how people can adopt epicureanism without being sort of very reclusive and having this very simple life so keep some principles like the um, like the hedonic calculus uh, but just use it in a more modern way. So, for example, use it to work out, as was mentioned earlier, the pain of going to university and studying for years if it is for a job later. So, in a way, keeping some of the principles, but using it in a life that is involved in society and mm. pursuing goals which are higher than just very simple, basic ones. Uh, yeah, just uh, on, on that point, because I feel like we've been perhaps a bit unfair on Epicurus and his followers that from my reading they're quite okay with the idea of going through some type of suffering for a better reward mm. so because otherwise like why would they go through all of this difficult philosophical thinking and just indulge in the simple sense pleasures they're Brent's not pretty great we, we were clear from the beginning that that's not what they're saying however when i was reading it it kept coming back to this idea of being a recluse almost that the best way to live a happy life is to avoid certain mm. types of struggle and that's why i think the relationship thing is is so is, there's so much friction here with what i i'd be really interested to just to talk to somebody who seems to have tried to adopt this because people might want to put themselves out there in the like in, in like a dating scene and yeah. maybe they will go through loads of different people to try and find the one or whatever they want to tell themselves the point is, is that <laughs> they they just <laughs> Sorry, I know that didn't mean to come off no, as no. quite as insulting as that. But the point is, is that people go through lots of hardships mm. to try and find the right person for mm. them and then might find at the end of it all that it was worthwhile. But that comes at a big social cost of rejection, a mm. lot of rejection that mm. might come with that. Equally, people want to commit to themselves to one person for their entire life, even if that also creates difficulties. Because any human choice automatically means that you have to shut other doors mm -hmm. it's the whole existential thing isn't it so you can't live a meaningful human life in my opinion by like almost playing it completely safe and saying i like, will not leave the garden walls so i don't get hurt yeah that sounds to me like a, a pretty poor way to choose to live a life i think that's probably being unfair to the epicureans i don't think that's quite what they're saying well I, I think i don't think you've been too unfair i think you criticism can be cashed out like this right that like hedonistic utilitarianism will just apply it to one person the maximization of what we generally think of as pleasure like sex good food good wine raving repeating like that kind Push of stuff in. goes into the calculus but for the epicurean it doesn't it's just it's negative utilitarianism for lack of better term mm. for the individual it's just removed the suffering so what you're saying is actually there are things there are pleasures that are worthwhile that can add to my to my net overall general happiness that are worth it well a lot of the time the epicureans were sat around thinking about whether or not it was or it wasn't and they came to the conclusion that it very rarely is but there are times when there's a threshold that's clearly crossed for example the examples are given in the text that 
if it turned out that people just stopped having kids within Athens and the walls, then people in the garden could start having kids and raise a family and get married and stuff like that. So there are clearly times when they were happy to set those rules aside. It's just whether or not it happens as a general rule for people. I think Epicurus says it several places, like for some people, marriage is a good thing. The familiarity of it in a healthy relationship can be good. Yeah. But I think what they do want to guard against is the superstition, which, yes, we might not think that death and the gods are things that bring suffering to people's lives in the 21st century. Don't like this phrase, but I'm going to use it. But here's how Epicurus is relevant today, <laughs> is that a lot of people still believe in the superstition of love, like Andrew said, like finding the one. Hmm. And that false belief, as if they were cut from the same cloth, like in Aristophanes' play, when the souls are pulled apart and they're just trying to find that person. I think Epicurus would say, yeah, you're going to be disappointed by that. You'll become obsessive. You'll, you'll sacrifice a lot of your own happiness. So... Yeah, he just says, like, just sleep around instead and and nothing will go yeah, wrong. Say yeah. that. I don't know. <laughs> I one, that. Of them, one of them definitely says, he, yeah. basically, one, of the, one of the bits of advice was basically, if you're trying to get over someone, get under someone else. <laughs> Which, it's like, like it might have been Lucretius or one of the others, but like you it's might not, as well it's have not said it. In, it's not in his beautiful poem. <laughs> yeah. He said it differently, yeah, but that fine. was like that was yeah. that was the point they were making. Sleeping yeah. with ten ones, um, like sleeping with yeah. If ten. you're obsessed with somebody else and it's causing you grief, <laughs> then you know, find around. somebody else to take your mind off them. <laughs> um, so it's a, a slightly different point, and I'm not again. I'm not sure if this is. I'm being unfair here, but. The point of saying, oh, well, the only things we need are the necessary natural things mm. and that everything else is nice extras, but you can do without them. And of course, literally speaking, that's true. Yeah. But if I had to recommend how one might go about trying to find a fulfilling life to live is that I would certainly stress the importance of those things a lot more. So we take this the simple example of food is that people like to learn how to cook complex dishes and mm. to push themselves with creativity and it's okay to enjoy the process of doing that and then giving it to other people and sharing the experience and there is a lot more to food than just basic nutrition that's mm. just that's a really limited way to experience food yes the, there is the ex the excessive stuff there but i would say what people should aim to do is find the bit where they get to put themselves into something creatively input experience the fulfillment of pushing yourself in that domain whatever it might be and you'll find that you get a lot of personal growth through doing that mm -hmm. how you get there from just saying oh focus on the natural necessary is not enough yeah it's interesting isn't it because we've got a lot of other thinkers at this time being like it's the simple life stupid it's not about being the warlord with all of the castles and all that sort of thing it's about a simple life actually a lot of these things you don't need and i agree with you there andy i think actually yeah i think if you take that too far i think there is you know anyone who's eaten the same meal two or three days in a row knows that there is something to variety and that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be luxurious i don't think like learning how to cook multiple different types of food or even wearing different clothes or having a holiday is tantamount to luxury right like and and even if it is that what's actually wrong with a little bit of luxury is it actually that bad i think for a lot of people that's often what keeps them going right like looking forward to half term looking forward to the christmas holidays looking forward to the summer like having these things to look forward to and be like actually i know even i'm having a rough time right now that in the future i'll be in a more pleasurable state then and that that's that keeps them going through that Whereas I guess if you were looking at it just from the Epicurean perspective, you may not even do that in the first place. I feel like there's certainly less emphasis on it. And the same thing you could, be, could be said of having a home. The hmm. people like to put themselves into it. Like the home becomes a project, an extension of themselves mm. where material things don't have to just be these unnecessary trinkets that mean nothing. Hmm. Um, objects can actually have great value to us because hmm. of the meaning that we impose on them. Somebody spending a lot of time and money and effort creating a really lovely home to live in I, I would never tell them like well, what a waste of your time you could have been doing something that was far more peaceful um, and he just walks in and he's just like that's rubbish <laughs> life is can be more fulfilling beyond the simple I wonder if he could actually account that into his philosophy I think he, yeah, yeah I think he because could, yeah. Although I think for him, the problem is of getting used to the luxuries. But mm. if you if you are having all this pleasure from decorating your house and putting meaning in your possessions, then I think it wouldn't necessarily be a, 
a, a bad thing. It's just one if as long as it wasn't causing you anxiety, mm-hmm. and then it would become a bad thing. Yeah. All right, then let's move into our concluding remarks. You want to kick us off, Mr. Ollie Marley? Thank you, Mr. Symes. Yes. So I think with concluding remarks, it's very easy to fall into a bit of drama or like a little bit of like, oh my God, I read Epicureanism that completely changed my life. It didn't. And I think this might be echoed with some of the other people in the room where I think that a lot of the ideas we were quite familiar with already, but that's okay. I think my takeaway from Epicureanism is there is something I think about him and the Epicureans as a, as a context of something that I was quite unaware of until I dove into it. So the idea that we have a materialistic, atomistic explanation, metaphysical system in the, with the ancient Greek schools in the Hellenistic age, the idea that being fearful of superstition and the, the focus on pleasure, the, the influence of this philosopher is just immense. You can see it in things like utilitarianism. You can see it in, in some in Marxist ideas as well. You can see it influencing science science and the renaissance and i think sometimes i'm I'm going to use this analogy it's probably not a good one but like you know the movie halloween right which kind of invented the slasher genre Mm -hmm. right for for horror movies if you watch that movie now you watch it and go this movie is incredibly cliche it's got the female protagonist that survives it's got like a serial killer that goes around stabbing people with a knife you're like i've seen that like what the hell (laughs) it's a good movie it's halloween right (laughs) Uh, however i think it's worth mentioning that like those ideas came from that place and Mm. actually as someone who's really interested in like the history of ideas and where certain thinkers lend themselves i i I found it really interesting that myself a lot of the ideas that i follow can be traced back to this thinker in ancient greece Mm. and that gives me an appreciation of those ideas and i'm really pleased that those ideas survived because i think that you know they've had a really big influence on the history of philosophical thought and whether it's the metaphysics whether it's the ethics i think that that's really good even though i think that the epicureans can kind of come off a little bit culty i think there is something about like i would have liked to hung out in the garden you know yeah, what i mean with I all my friends i would with my friends and i think there would be something where maybe would i have wanted to have lived there i don't know but to visit i think it would have been it would have been pretty interesting to see that kind of philosophy in action you know one of the biggest critiques of philosophy is it has no practical use it's just people in their armchairs thinking about impossible questions where i think you have a person who is encouraging slaves women anybody to come to this effectively like free university Mm. right where they can discuss the nature and the meaning of life and live a life of trying to dedicate themselves to making themselves happier and you know what i think that that's very meaningful and i think that that's uh fair enough to epicurus the only possible because epicurus parents gave him oh yeah and he did buy a massive (laughs) house like the garden was quite small the house was big was it yeah i didn't know yeah yeah yeah, anyone made of atoms welcome mr andrew horton (laughs) I thought it was racist. Apologies, I just ignored the the order there. We're well. going to cut this. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's um, definitely not making the cut. <laughs> um, what I really enjoyed uh, about reading of Epicurus was just the grandness of his theory, and especially just the idea that he argued for the existence of atoms, and then really thought that he could explain just everything from that, from sort of think thoughts, a perception, the creation of the world and all that. I think that was just very ambitious and quite amazing to read about. And obviously, as Ollie just said, about how that's influenced the scientific revolution and the Renaissance and all those sort of things. And then I also really liked more of his anthropology sort of side, the idea of societies changing, that nothing is permanent. Um, and just the idea that nature renews and creates and then gets destroyed. I think that's quite an interesting thing to read. And generally, I find that when you read about anthropology still now in the present, uh, like if you read something like Sapiens, hmm. it has the same sort of outcome that you sort of see what we have gained through the new technologies and all of that and whether it makes you consider whether the things we have gained are good or not. And so as Ollie was saying, even though it doesn't seem so radical now when we think of material possessions as being potentially harmful it is reflected in a lot of other philosophies i think for the ethics itself i would maybe take on board that point of not worrying so much about material excess but i would say going back to our discussion whether we should let avoiding pain dictate our life i think i would probably rather follow another philosophy like aristotle's philosophy of cultivating the virtues and not avoiding pain you've said it all both of you i have nothing to add um, <laughs> no we feel every time yeah. <laughs> um yeah there's a there's a couple of things that 
well, definitely will be repeating some of what you both said there. But the things that I would gain personally from reading Epicurus were things that I I feel like because of the influence of those ideas, I'd already adopted. So uh, as somebody who doesn't have faith in God, I don't have to worry. I don't have fears and anxieties about what God thinks of me, nor do I worry about an afterlife. So that very much in the, the same ballpark. Mm. Um, some of the stuff to do with death that I had come across in other writings before approaching Epicurus. So it was just nice to see where some of those ideas originated from. So in that sense, I, I'm in complete agreement that it's really interesting just to see the history of thought and how powerful the influence of Epicurus is could have been completely lost to time if it mm. wasn't for, for a bit of luck really mm. um, and that these ideas then had a profound impact so for that i think we can all be incredibly grateful other things i think like linking into i, I used paul bloom's stuff to criticize earlier but he does point out which i think is a quite common knowledge to anybody who's read a lot of these kind of books around moral psychology and human happiness and stuff like that but just just to quote him here it says According to a study, pursuing extrinsic goals related to praise and reward, so looking looking attractive, making money, building up social status, make you less happy and less fulfilled, and are linked to depression, anxiety, and mental illness. And that seems to be exactly in the lines of what yeah. Epicurus was all about, mm. that a lot of the, the sort of mental illness that we experience come from uh, trying to fulfill certain things that just can never really be fully mm. fulfilled. And so then taking a step back away from those things and learning learning our limits and and focusing on the things that are more in our control seems to be pretty good advice um, for any any age, any period of time, because those things are just part of our evolutionary moral psychology that just are just going to keep cropping up mm. again and again. Perhaps some timeless wisdom there. I guess my issue is is with a lot of the stuff that we covered in the dis wider discussion on the criticisms. Uh, I, I think it's too simplistic. I, I don't like the focus on on trying to like this renunciation of the world and of certain things there's a lot of enjoyment by pushing yourselves and trying to find meaning in different projects mm. that i don't see in the work of epicurus that may be found elsewhere mm. um i couldn't speak meaningfully on that one other thing that we didn't mention i i guess is worth mentioning is the political aspects of it i mean you mentioned marx ollie mm. and you could see how epicurus could offer seemingly is a very radical change to what is the common conception mm. uk politics at the moment is it's all about how do we grow the economy and that anything that seemingly goes against economic growth is not part of the the way in which we can possibly even entertain as being mm. a way to structure society and so if you looked at that then somebody following an epicurean worldview would actually radically change the way that this country is being run we adopted the views of epicurus the world would look incredibly different mm. to what it currently appears to be mm. so simple ideas yet seemingly radical that's that's it. That's, yeah, that's it. <laughs> What's not a love? <laughs> that's it. I really liked in Lucretius's on the nature of the universe. He goes through like these horrific events. He's constantly talking about like plagues and death and destruction. And apparently, the idea there is Lucretius is trying to see whether we've took the message home, whether we actually accept there's nothing really bad with death. Are we still moved by that same? I'm thing? Pretty sure that he did say if you can't get over her, get under somebody else as well. <laughs> yeah. There's also yeah. some advice like on breakups and stuff. Did you get that? It was like make sure you don't hear their name and you don't have the stuff. Yeah, around. I, can, I came like, across. Are you gay? Yeah, you gay, Lucretius? <laughs> yeah, you're right, dude. Do you some help. <laughs> but I thought that the whole experience was really therapeutic and uh, it was like a great meditation. And I mentioned off microphone in between part two and three how much I love Daniel Klein's travels with Epicurus. I read it a couple of years ago and it, it still is probably, if not my favorite public philosophy book of all time, certainly in the mm. top five. It's such a wonderfully written book. And I was trying to explain to Andrew how good of a writer I think he is, but I couldn't find the words that didn't sound like I was over-exaggerating. But I couldn't exaggerate how enough, how great his prose are. And when you're reading it, I remember traveling Greece that when I was reading it the first time, I never wanted to leave. It was, it was just like you could see it all around you in the way of life in terms of taking pleasure in the simple things and having that relaxed mindset and not just chasing everything in terms of well the kind of destinations i was visiting <laughs> yeah. everyone was on holiday <laughs> sorry to, to, to chip in on your concluding remarks but actually <laughs> you, you, you've saved them <laughs> they were going so well um but 
actually, one on, on reflection, one, one of the things I think might be quite useful to think about with these different Hellenistic schools of thought are that because I, I believe that he did he write that book when he was already in his 70s and he's looking for a, like a new way to approach old like basically he wants mm. a way to grow into old age in a way that is not what some people do which is try to hold on to eternal youth mm. and and mm. so he's exploring how can i be happy in this stage of my 75 life 75 years old when he wrote right so all of the stuff i was explaining about risk taking and all of these things perhaps are more immediate for people who are quite young or still have a lot of life to live and there's so many opportunities there but when you get older, these types of way of thinking, you can't, I can't think of many better ways to experience old age mm, than spending yeah. time with friends and enjoying the simple life. Yeah. That sounds really, Lots really pleasant. Um, so I think there's something definitely to be said there where I think perhaps I was being a bit too overly critical. Yeah, it's not just it's spending time with friends. In the Daniel Klein one, everyone's smoking cigarettes on every other page. Like, you know, when you read an existential <laughs> novel and then you just like, I feel like I'm being marketed upon. I was when I read Epicurus, I started drinking lots of water i purchased myself a water bottle i was just reading it so much i was just like i should he's drinking so much water maybe i need some so i learned something from the text but most fundamentally you know there can't be an atom so small that god can't divide it there can't be void in which god isn't present but on a serious note i really enjoyed the looking at the metaphysics the moral philosophy how much of a precursor there's so many things in physics and in cognitive psychotherapy and yeah, I like uh, Klein describes it as a life enchanting poetry rather than a testable theory. And I think that's what I'd read Epicurus as, as a really, really, really good self-help guru who can just remind you of the stuff that's important in life. And so it's hard not to get on board with that. Stop right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't thinking you would say that. I I'm going to do I, it anyway. Stop right now. Thank you very much. I need a company that sells stylish, ethical backpacks. Hey you, always on the run? Go to GastonLuger.com and have some fun. Gaston Luger have created an amazing collection of backpacks that bring together fashion and function. Their beautiful Scandinavian minimalism combines with smart storage and the long-lasting materials that make a backpack that's perfect for any occasion, whether you're enjoying your bread and water with your homies or dying from kidney stones. <laughs> you're joking. No, I quit. This is embarrassing. As Jesus tells us in Luke 12:33, embrace the festive season by going to gastonluger.com and enjoy 15% off all purchases purchases with the discount code PANPSYCAST, that's P-A-N-P-S-Y-C-A-S-T. A link is also in the iTunes description. Thank you again to Gaston Luger for sponsoring the show. Let's jump into the discussion. It's time for everybody's favourite part of the show, it's Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz. Pop 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 Pop, 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 pop. Philosophy Quiz. Welcome to the Christmas special of Pop Pop Philosophy <laughs> Quiz. If you're listening to this on Patreon, then it's probably Halloween time or a couple of weeks after. And if you're listening on the main feed, then Merry Christmas. We're playing Apul Sirius Apicurus. Wait, what? So we've got quotes from Apul, the English musician and Beatles superstar Sir Apul McCartney. He sang the Christmas song, didn't he? Uh, we've got a serious. <laughs> yeah, he just doesn't sound anything like a Epicurus. Oh, I thought you were looking at me really peculiar. No, 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 no. I'm just like, Christmas. where did Paul McCartney so, come uh, from? I mean, the accent is whatever. I don't know what that is. Uh, uh, and also, what? Yeah. Uh, serious. So, so we've got quotes from Sirius Black, the Hogwarts graduate and Azkaban <laughs> escapee, born in Islington in 1959. And we've got quotes from one of the most prolific and influential thinkers in the history of Western philosophy, it's your boy, Epicurus. Andy, you can, I'm going to put your points on from last time because I already wrote them down. So it's 4 0 to Andrew before we start. <laughs> right, so fastest finger first. So I want to hear Paul, Sirius, or Epicurus. <laughs> Can you see that word that time? Yeah. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure, it did. We all live in a yellow submarine. Oh, my God. Submarine, yellow submarine. The world isn't split into good Sirius people and, and death eaters. If you want to know what a man's like, Epicurus. take a good look at how he treats his inferiors, not his equals. Uh, serious black. It's serious black. Well done, Andrew. Uh, I do have a belief in goodness, a good serious spirit. black. No, I think what people have done with religion is Paul some McCartney. of Paul McCartney. Mm -hmm. Rose. I would like to be under the sea. Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually Ringo Starr that uh, sang that song there, Jack. I think 
McCartney wrote it though. I don't know, I think Ringo wrote it. You know? I yeah, Ringo if, if Ringo's singing it, he probably, yeah, he probably did write it. Yeah, yeah. Think about these and related matters day and night. By yourself and in company yeah. with someone like yourself, Epicurus. The search for mental health is never in time. Epicurus. Season. Yeah. We've all got both light and darkness inside. Serious, Serious black. black. Yeah. Serious black. <laughs> uh, Ollie, I'm going to give you the point for that one. So it makes it 5-5-2. Five, five, so yeah, a draw. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the main thing was though that it all comes down to us all having a pleasurable experience. It doesn't matter who wins. It's not a competition. Not about fame. Not about power. Yeah, I can't believe that with all, all of that, when you picked a Ringo Star one, that you didn't do the getting by with my friends. Yeah, you get by like, with a little help with my friends. Yeah. Uh, I don't listen to the Beatles. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> it's that bad. <laughs> Yeah. I know that I'd like them. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I'd like them, but I lived in Liverpool for such a long time that I know. Yeah, you hear you're so you're much in, about yeah. them. I, I know what you mean. I, I know was you sick mean. of them before yeah. I even started listening to them. <laughs> we renew their names. Thank you again for joining us for an episode of the Pan Psycast. Remember, we're going over to the Patreon now to record an after show. We've got loads of cool stuff heading your way. Lots of great guests. If you go onto the website, go on to panpsychast.com links in the iTunes description and hover over upcoming episodes and you can find links to ask our future guests questions thank you you've been listening to the wonderful beautiful soothing voices of Rose de Castellan from Epicurus no one should postpone the study of philosophy when he is young nor should he weary of it when he has become mature because the search for mental health is never untimely or out of season Mr. Ollie Marley. Philosophy, as long as a drop of blood shall pulse in its world, subduing an absolutely free heart, will never grow tired of answering its adversaries with the cry of Epicurus. Mr. Jack Sines. From Epicurus, nothing is sufficient for the person who finds sufficiency too little. And me, Miss Andrew Horton. From Philodemus, nothing to fear in God, nothing to feel in death. Good can be attained, evil can be endured. Nice. Lovely. Now for some water, maybe? Some Why have all the things you took from a curious drinking water <laughs> was the main thing you took? <laughs> what an enlightening so philosophical they, They're all so happy. There must be the secret to the happiness somewhere. And I read between the lines. I just love the idea that you haven't drank water in how many years have you been alive? I've just never thought of drinking it. I just like the taste of juice and wine and coffee. And that like stimulates my taste buds. Sure. And water doesn't really taste like anything. Yeah, so... But I invested in a Chili's water bottle, which retailed at <laughs> a, a very modest oh, wait, £30 from Chili's.com. And £30 pounds for a water bottle. Oh my bottle. God. Why is that? I'm sorry, is that not a big I mean, I didn't pay anything for mine, I don't think. Do you, really? Do you have one? Yeah, I just got given one for free, I think, once. Yeah. By who? Was <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it the uni? I think it was the uni. Yeah. <laughs> you sure? I think so, yeah. And it was clean. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> Join us in the after show. You want yeah. more quality we'll content. You're wondering what happens, what happens at the end from. of the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is a subscriber I'm this point, We've this definitely is like trailed. Like the the, the, the volume has gone down, down, down. down. Yeah. So you can't hear anything. <laughs>